If you're interested in what China's doing in Africa and the Global South, you're going to want to subscribe to the China Africa Project. We've indexed every major news story going back years, and it's easily searchable by country, topic, or keyword. Plus, we're the only source for daily analysis on all of the big stories related to Chinese engagement in Africa and throughout the developing world. With a subscription, you'll enjoy full access to the site. Plus, you'll get our popular daily email newsletter that comes out every morning at 6 a.m. Washington time. Subscriptions start at just $7 a month for students and teachers and $15 a month for everyone else. To sign up, just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to take stock of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's East Africa in Indian Ocean States tour that took place last week. Just a quick heads up. To everybody in our Patreon community, we're going to be doing our monthly briefings at the end of the week on Thursday night U.S. time and Friday in for the rest of the world, uh, Europe, Africa, and here in Asia. So if you would like to join these discussions that we're doing every month, we also do one-on-one briefings. And of course, you get a weekly digest of the top news in China-Africa affairs and now increasingly China Global South affairs. Head over to our Patreon community at patreon.com slash China Africa Project. And a huge heartfelt thank you to all of our Patreon members who are supporting this show. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Okay, Kobus. For the 32nd year in a row, the Chinese foreign minister has made Africa the destination for his first overseas trip of the year. Wang Yi went on a five-nation, six-day tour of East Africa in Indian Ocean states that took him to, uh, in order here, Eritrea, Kenya, the Comoros Islands, Maldives, and Sri Lanka. Before we get to the East Africa portion of the trip, which will occupy the bulk of our discussion today, Let's quickly go through some of the highlights of his weekend stops in the Indian Ocean states. And again, Kobus, this is something that we're doing more in our coverage in the daily newsletter and on the website by talking about regions outside of Africa in order to provide that broader global context, particularly in the global south, to what's happening in Africa. Because you'll hear a lot of the themes are very similar. So in Sri Lanka... He met on Sunday with President Gotabaya Rajapaska and his brother, Prime Minister Malina Rajapaska. They are part of the ruling family of Sri Lanka. And debt was the top issue. $6.9 billion in debt repayments are due this year alone. Citigroup is forecasting that this potentially is a very big problem for Sri Lanka. $500 million is due, in fact, at the end of this month. And there's another billion dollar payment due in July. And China is by far the largest creditor to Sri Lanka with an estimated $3.4 billion of known debt. So there's also another part of this story that there's loans to Sri Lankan state-owned enterprises that are not disclosed. So we actually don't know the full extent of the debt exposure in Sri Lanka. But all of this is contributing to much larger financial problems. And just as in many African countries, Sri Lanka is also confronting a burgeoning foreign exchange crisis. The country is using more of its forex to buy imports, and that in turn puts pressure on the rupee. And then we have this vicious cycle. In fact, that's a problem in Kenya today and also in Nigeria, where more dollars are going out the door to buy imports, and it's causing devaluation of the local currency there. Let's move over to the Maldives, where he was on Saturday. Also, a very similar story on debt. Wang unveiled a $63 million package of infrastructure grants. 
But he didn't say anything publicly about debt relief, and it didn't come up in the readout of the meetings that he had with both the foreign minister and the president. The Maldives is among the most indebted countries in the region, mostly to China with obligations that are somewhere around 1.4 to 3.5 billion. Again, we have a transparency issue here where we just don't know the true extent of the debt. Now, that may not sound like a lot of money, 1.4 billion or 3.5 billion, but when you consider the fact that the GDP of the Maldives is just $5 billion, it's absolutely enormous. And then there's the Comoros Islands where he was on Friday. No debt issues came up there at all. Instead, it was focused on health issues, enough COVID vaccines for herd immunity. They announced a deal for the Chinese to bring in uh, more vaccines. Now, that's not going to be a very big challenge for the Chinese, given the fact that the Comoros Islands has a really small population of just 900,000 people. The two sides also agreed to support a 15-year-old anti-malaria initiative that China pioneered in the Comoros and said they hope to eliminate the disease by 2025. So, Cobus, you and I were talking earlier about this off-air, and you don't think it's a coincidence that all of the states on this year's tour are connected in some way to the Indian Ocean. Tell us more about that. Well, you know, it's it's always very difficult to to kind of make prognostications about Wang Yi's trips because you know who knows what what goes into the the choices of the of the particular countries, but in this case, they, it was interesting that they were all geographically in a zone. You know, they were all Indian Ocean related. They were all kind of Indo Pacific related, um, and all of these island states um, that, that he visited also share this this kind of aspect that, that that they're all kind of traditionally in India's kind of sphere of influence and that a lot of them are facing, uh, you know, not only competing kind of pressures from India and China, but also uh, those pressures are, are accompanied by a lot of infrastructure deals, you know. So, so there's kind of competing infrastructure funding from India and China in places like the Maldives and, and in Sri Lanka. Um, you know, so, so it, was just, it was just very interesting um, that it, in the first place it all focused, what se- it seems to focus on, you know, kind of what, what we might call China's backyard, um, you know, the, if the Indian Ocean kind of, you know, is, is, is part of this kind of field where China feels it has a kind of a natural, a natural sphere of influence, um, you know, so, so that was interesting. It was, it was also interesting that it seemed to be a move away from West Africa, which of, of course was heavily represented during FOCAC, but it was also in the process then the kind of a move away from, from the Atlantic coast where, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of stakeholders in the United States have, made the, have, have insisted that China is planning a, a base on, on on Africa's western coast, um, you know. So so it, it was interesting to see this kind of pivot eastwards um, towards the Indian Ocean and towards this kind of more traditional sphere of influence for China. Now, Chinese scholars will tell you that the reason why he went to East Africa this time and not West Africa is because they want to do balance. That they tried to achieve some measure of equality among the different regions. Who knows? As you talked about, what the formula is for them to select. The different countries, again, we just have no insights into this. And honestly, looking at the literature as we did this week from various Chinese scholars like Ho Wenping at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, they don't really provide any meaningful insight either. But let's talk about Kenya and Eritrea. We're going to focus on that for the bulk of our discussion today. And it also, again, touches on the crisis in Ethiopia. And for that, we're thrilled to have back on the show again Dr. Oscar Otele, a lecturer in political science at the University of Nairobi, who's been closely following all of these recent events. Oscar, good afternoon and welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Kobas and Eric, for having me once more. It's great to have you back, and I'm looking forward to getting your insights. Before we dive into what happened in Kenya, let me just run through the bullet points of everything that happened. And there was a lot, and I don't even think I've got everything here. So let me just quickly set up our discussion, Oscar, and then I'm going to have you put some perspective to this. He did not go to Nairobi on this visit, and instead he flew directly into the southern port city of Mombasa, My take on that was that he wanted to contrast his tour from that of U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who was just about a month ago, actually, or maybe six weeks ago, 
in Nairobi. Uh, he wanted the focus to be on trade and commerce, and that, of course, is what happens in Mombasa. While he was there, he met with the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs and joined part of a ministerial roundtable meeting. Uh, so the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs, of course, is Rachel Omamo. And he also held a very important joint press conference with her, a live press conference, where he announced the appointment of a special envoy for the Horn of Africa. Incidentally, on the same day as the United States replaced their special envoy for the Horn of Africa. So on, again, so weird that it's a coincidence, but two new special envoys from both of the powers for the Horn of Africa. He signed six agreements, including trade deals for avocados and fish products. He then held a one-on-one -on -one with President Uru Kenyatta at the State House Mombasa. And again, reflecting on the relationship between Kenyatta and Wang, these are guys who both came up together in 2013. So in many ways, the trajectory of Kenyatta's tenure in office mirrors that of Wang Yi as foreign minister. Interesting to get your take on that. And then finally, he and the president went to do a site inspection of the nearly completed Kipevu oil terminal that is under construction by Chinese contractors. Incidentally, it's being paid for by the Kenya Port Authority, but contracted and built by Chinese contractors. So Oscar, a lot happened. What stood out for you? on this trip. As you have rightly put, this is actually the fourth, to be precise, the fourth visit of a Chinese foreign minister to Kenya. Rather, if you put this into the wider um, uh, picture, in terms of the um, you know, political transition between uh, leadership transition in Kenya, and of course, at the time when the Chinese foreign minister also took over, it will appear that uh, these two leaders have had uh, some kind of, uh, you know, consistency uh, in 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 the um, China China Kenya relation. And what I'm seeing is some kind of, you know, institutional memory as far as how this engagement is concerned. Remember uh, when President Uhuru Kenyatta came to power um, in 2013, China was the first country that he visited and therefore what we are seeing actually is a more enhanced uh, bilateral relation which has actually uh, gotten to a comprehensive uh, level where we are seeing a more and more uh, deepened engagement. Uh, suffice to say that um, his decision actually uh, to, to, to visit Mombasa was quite interesting. O of course, uh, the, the, the whole idea was to go and visit uh, Kipev uh, oil terminals and see how the progress is, you know, has, uh, has, gone, has gone on. But it, it's, inter it's interesting because you see Mombasa is um, uh, it, it's, um, it's a what it's a coastline city. And in the context of the visit again, uh, Mombasa becomes a very strategic place uh, to go to remember uh, just as the as Cobas said earlier on, uh, the interest in Indian Ocean, seeing the seeing the minister uh, visit Eritrea. Uh, Kenya, that is in Mombasa, and to, 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 to Comoros Island. So what we are seeing here is some, uh, you know, still uh, interest in ensuring that actually uh, Belt and Road Initiative, especially now this, you know, the, the hotspots of it, where we, we have uh, Mombasa there. Uh, recently in November, you saw Eritrea coming on board. So it, it, it also has to be seen within uh, the, you know, the, the, the wider context of um, implementation of the BRI, uh, you know, BRI, uh, you know, hotspots, hot and of course, uh, seeing to it that um, whatever that is being implemented, uh, follow, fo follow through uh, the action, action points as they were laid out uh, during the eighth uh, FOCAC, uh, some FOCAC Focus conference in in Senegal, so that has to be seen from uh, you know that wider context of uh, you know China Africa uh, engagement. Oscar, what did you make of of the announcement in the first place that the the, the 
China is appointing a special envoy to the Horn of Africa region. And then with it, almost in the same, on the same day, the announcement that, that Jeffrey Feltman, the, the current United States special envoy to the, to the Horn of Africa, is being replaced by David Satterfield, the, um, the outgoing uh, U.S. ambassador to Turkey. So, you know, kind of what, what do you make of this sudden kind of like dynamic that we're seeing of these two special envoys for the region? My my take on um, on on on, Ch- on you know China's appointment of the envoy and of course that also happening at the same time when the US is uh, you know replacing the former envoy has to be seen uh, in the context of uh, Beijing's uh, interest in peace and security uh, matters within the Horn, uh, so that it happened at the same time. What we actually seeing is some kind of uh, you know geo you know geopolitical uh, competition. Uh, between uh, uh, between um, the West now the West led uh, led by, by by the US and of course uh, China on the other on the other side, it's attempt to you know incre- to increase uh, influence. Uh, remember remember issues happening in the in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Ethiopia has the situation in Ethiopia has been um, you know has attracted a lot of interest. Ethiopia borders uh, borders Djibouti, and you know uh, Djibouti actually is the first country in in, in the world to have both uh, military uh, military you know points uh, harboring harboring the interest of both the U.S. and and China, and 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 so it becomes you know an an area that actually these two great powers are seeing to each other that they continue uh, to take you know a significant role as far as peace and conflict uh, is concerned now uh, the, the trouble with that as i have argued elsewhere actually it's a double tragedy because uh, as these powers do compete uh, you know to have strong influence what we are going to see in in, in future is the countries in the region are actually likely to now to start again taking sides as it were during Cold War. And we are going to see the US, you know, try to bring its axis around certain allies. China is also likely to bring its allies around certain axis. And this competition may actually have a spillover effect on um, regional integration, uh, regional integration, and of course, uh, you know, sort of a prolonging, uh, you know, uh, how to handle the whole situation and so um, the, you know as i have said it is just some kind of uh, a scenario that uh, is, is is keen and we are we are, we are, we are keenly uh, watching to see how that is is, is likely to un- unfold in future let me give you my take on this and i'd like to hear your responses to whether or not you think i'm going down the right path or completely just off the base here um I think the only reason that the Chinese are appointing a special envoy in Ethiopia is because they feel they have the upper hand now in the conflict, that they back the right side. That is, uh, Prime Minister Abayi is gaining momentum and pushing back the TPLF, and the Prime Minister has been you know, an avid supporter of the Chinese, and the Chinese have been a vocal supporter of the Prime Minister in pushing back against the United States. We need to remind everybody that on the first of the year, the United States stripped free trade privileges under the AGOA uh, trade relationship with Ethiopia. It also uh, cut off funding for Prosper Africa and a whole number of other issues. That has alienated large swaths of the Ethiopian community that supports the prime minister and the, and, and the Ethiopian government. China has momentum now. Had China not had this momentum, it certainly would not have done that. So it has the upper hand. And the United States has had a policy which I think people in D.C. generously say is in disarray. No one really knows what the U.S. policy stands for, and that's not just in Ethiopia, but also in Sudan and elsewhere in the Horn. And so this is China making its move. And and I guess the question is, if the United States has a special envoy and China has a special envoy, the two sides thoroughly hate each other. They're not going to cooperate or collaborate together in the name of stability for uh, the Horn of Africa, because we know they're diametrically opposed on the issue of sanctions and intervention. So where where does this lead us? You know, what's your take on on my assessment on that, and where you think that that this is going to go, given the fact that the United States and China um, are on opposite sides? 
No, I, I, I mean, uh, Eric, you, 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 are, uh, you are absolutely right. And, uh, you know, uh, just additional uh, perspective, as you've rightly put. Uh, indeed, China actually uh, has uh, increasingly obtained strategic advantage over the U.S. as far as uh, it is uh, bilateral relation is concerned. And this actually has to be seen, um, you know, still in the context of uh, a recent engagement, even before the, prime, the current prime minister uh, came in. Remember the, le the late, uh, you know, f uh, former prime minister, uh, China has had very deep, you know, engagement on matters, infrastructure, and it's actually done considerable um, considerable investments in the infrastructure sector, in trade. And therefore, the, the, the heavy investments, uh, Chinese heavy investment in Ethiopia, in Djibouti, and of course, neighboring Eritrea, has in a way also uh, given this impetus for China to, you know, uh, go ahead now to the next level. Uh, because for China to protect its economic interest now, it has to move to the next level to try and also to see where else, where possible, uh, can it actively engage in, um, you know, on, 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 on security issues. And, uh, and so I would say that the, the conflict, uh, the degree conflict now becomes some kind of uh, a window of opportunity to gradually insert China into you know um, into peace and security issues in the horn even though it claims that uh, it will actually prefer that uh, ethiopia actually actively leads the process uh, you know uh, hiding behind its traditional policy on an interference but we know that actually it will really want to ensure that it also take active role as far as uh, security issues are concerned within, uh, you know, the, the Horn of African region. So, you know, during Wang Yi's visit, he uh, he made this, these oblique references to inviting the, the, the participants and stakeholders in the region to some kind of peace process or peace conference. Um, I was wondering how that that kind of announcement was taken in Kenya, um, and and more generally how Kenya is seeing the issue, the, the the kind of conflict in Ethiopia and China's position in it. You know, for example, the upgrading like during also during the visit, um, it was announced that the China Eritrea relationship has been upgraded to a strategic partnership. So I was wondering what, considering that this is not obviously in in, in Kenya's immediate environment, but or immediate neighborhood but in in its wider kind of regional space um and that kenya is affected by by the conflicts in in the horn of africa so i was wondering what kenya is making of these kind of moves by china in the horn of africa i think for for kenya i, I say it's good news for kenya because um uh, given it is a you know a comprehensive strategic engagement with china um a placing Kenya at the you know at the forefront in terms of coordinating the issues uh, on matters to do with peace and security in Ethiopia, in a way also um, you know propels the the country's uh, you know leadership uh, leadership role as as as, as matters uh, you know peace and mediation is concerned. Remember, uh, Kenya within the East African region and of course the Horn has actually been at the forefront. On, uh, on, on, on on these issues, uh, Kenya has taken a leadership role in in Ethiopia, sorry, in um, Somalia, in, in in South Sudan, you know. And in my view, I I will want to believe that um, it will be in the interest of Kenya actually to continue uh, pursuing a similar leadership role, and therefore the support. Uh, provided by China, the, that political will, the political will that it's getting from uh, Beijing, in, in in a way now will actually assist, will will propel uh, the leadership in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, it 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 provide the necessary coordination role as is as as envisioned uh, by uh, by Beijing uh, policymakers. Kobus, there is no way on God's green earth that the Chinese are going to be able to convene a legitimate peace conference or some kind of roundtable because, you know, the TPLF would never join because China is not an impartial actor here. 
right? I mean, they are solidly on the side of Prime Minister Abe in the government. So again, it reminds me a little bit of when China made the offer to be a Mideast, you know, have a Mideast roundtable or peace process too. And this was something that experts throughout the Mideast region were saying, nobody's asking for it and it'll never work. And China has no experience in doing any of this. And the fact that they've become so partisan in the Ethiopian conflict just makes me think that why would any of the opposition parties take a Chinese-led roundtable seriously? Well, you know, yeah, I, I think that I think that that is a legitimate take. Um, I think there's an alternative take, which is that that East Africa, particularly in, in the form of of the kind of off, offshore patrolling of of shipping routes in Somalia, and the the peace processes in South Sudan, Sudan, South Sudan have in the past provided a space for for China to 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 have a kind of a, a you know kind of low key kind of engagement with 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 formerly kind of hostile foreign partners right kind of so so there there was some cooperation with with I think with Japan and with with the US in in these processes and we've seen over the last while the Biden administration also having these kind of sub state level kind of like outreach efforts between China and the US. So there, there, there might be the possibility, although I do think it's a remote possibility, that that it, this may create a kind of a space for cooperation on terms where they wouldn't, where these parties would normally wouldn't be able, wouldn't be willing to cooperate. Um, you know that that the, that at obviously best case scenario, there might even be a space for these two different envoys to work something out. That said, of course, we this is a we're in 2022. This is not 2015, you know, kind of like things have, have become extremely frosty on all sides. So I don't think it's necessarily a very strong possibility, but I think that is a counter possibility, maybe. I think you're misreading the political climate in the United States. Yeah, no, I'm sure. I mean, it's, yeah. That already on Fox News today, they are preparing for the Republicans to take office again. And they're already talking about taking a harder line on China, no cooperation, no collaboration. And Tucker Carlson on Fox would have a field day if the U.S. was seen to be giving any concessions to the Chinese in Ethiopia. And there's just no political maneuverability now for the Biden administration, given the pressure that they're under with the midterms coming. Oscar, what's your take on this before we move on? No, no. Actually, I wanted to just to support the idea that uh, was raised by by Cobas, if I if I still remember, that um, as long as Beijing is leading this this process, actually, uh, the Tigris People's Liberation Front is is likely to 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 to, to be reluctant to you know to, to join and actively participate in the whole peace process because um, already China has already taken side. If it's siding with the with the Ethiopian government, so obviously that you know the process is beginning in a way that is uh, is, is skewed against the the, libra the, the people's libra liberation f uh, front, and therefore uh, I'm a bit uh, hesitant to see where this where, whether the the whole uh, process. May, may may yield uh, much food. So what we what what we are seeing here is um is a situation where uh, this peace talk may continue continue for you know um, prolong for quite some time if uh, if actually you know China continues to to you know to lead to lead the process. That, 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 that's that's my view. Let's move back down to Mombasa from Ethiopia, back to the visit to the Kipevu oil terminal by Wang Yi and Udu Kenyatta. Ostensibly, they were looking at inspection of the new, I think it's about $350 million oil terminal. This is a new facility that's going to quadruple the size of Kenyans to be able to process oil imports. And the argument that's made by Kenyatta, and again, when you're hearing Kenyatta make these speeches now, you always get a sense that he's looking to his legacy now, because Kenyatta is not going to be running for re-election in the general election that will take place in August of this year. And he's talking about infrastructure as his big legacy. This Kipevu oil terminal is one of them. So they'll be able to have four berths now to process aviation fuel, diesel fuel, automotive fuels that will come into the country because there won't be backlogs of ships stacking up off the coast of Mombasa. It will be cheaper and more affordable for fuel to make it into the country. As he said, putting money right into the Kenyan taxpayer's pocket. Now, interestingly, 
during his speech, and the way that Kenyatta gives speeches, I'm going to miss this because this is a guy who does not use a teleprompter. He does not use these prepared comments. He just kind of huddles over the podium, hugs the microphone, and just starts to riff. And it's a lot of fun to listen to because you really get the sense that he's speaking just, you know, from what is in his heart. I mean, you get the sense that he's just, he's riffing here. So let me play some sound bites for you. And, and these sound bites caught my attention because in the discussion about the Chinese in Africa and in the Global South that takes part in the discourse in Europe and the United States, one would see that it's all negative, it's all predatory, it's all about debt trap. It's all about the victimization of Africans. And here you're going to hear from one of the most prominent African stakeholders, an assertive voice on agency as to why, again, why he likes and he thinks that China is a good partner for Kenya. Our partnership with China is not a partnership based on China telling us what we need. It is a partnership of friends working together to meet Kenya's social economic agenda. The old KOT, which for many years we have struggled with, was not able to meet the demands of an increasing population, to meet the demands of a growing economy. We needed this facility to be able to cater for those demands. And China was there when we asked for partnership in developing it. They were there ready to walk with us hand in hand. And that indeed is what you call a friend. And today, I want to thank our partners, the People's Republic of China, for being there and walking with us hand in hand and meeting us at our point of need. So you heard in those comments some veiled references to the criticisms in the U.S. and Europe. China doesn't tell us what to do. And, and again, this is why I love listening to people like Kenyatta speak. That is, a again, an affirmative voice of agency in the relationship. We are actively seeking out China. Now, he had another comment here, and, and Oscar, I want to get your take on this one in particular, where he really really directs his, his, his comments towards the U.S. and Europe, and you'll hear it right off the bat. Let's take a listen. Kenya, Africa does not need lectures. Kenya, Africa needs friends willing to work with us to achieve our goals and our aspirations. And today, through you, Minister, I want to thank the President, the government, and the people of China for being true friends indeed and meeting us at our point of need to be able to help us achieve the social economic development that we are achieving. We look forward to continuing to increase that pace of development and working together for the mutual benefit of our two countries in a win-win situation and indeed through our discussions today, we have also focused ourselves not just on infrastructure, but how to increase trade between our two countries, how China can open more of their market for Kenyan product, and will enable us to help our farmers get new markets, that will enable us to help our farmers add value to their product and having access to the huge Chinese market. Oscar, we don't need lectures. I mean, he could not have been more clear on who he was directing that towards. And again, he extended a thank you to the minister, the president, Xi Jinping in this case, and the Chinese people for what they've done. I was disappointed that the international media did not cover this aspect of the speech at all. There was no mention of this in AP, Reuters, Bloomberg, any of it. We looked very, very carefully today for it. Only state propaganda outlets in China and Kenya 
covered that part of the speech. And I think that's a shortcoming in part because in the discussion, as I mentioned, in the U.S. and Europe about the Chinese in Africa, it's framed in a decidedly negative voice. And in this case here, you hear, again, one of Africa's most prominent stakeholders articulate a very positive vision for what he sees in the China-Africa relationship. What's your reaction? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric, for bringing this to uh, this discussion. I'll again revisit a point that I made earlier, that actually uh, the, the context of uh, uh, Africans uh, do not need lectures from elsewhere, and particularly in the in Kenyan case, has to be seen uh, within a certain uh, you know a certain background, and this background uh, is rooted in the period preceding 2013 March election. Remember the current president was actually indicted by international uh, criminal court. Uh, he was actually facing crimes against humanity and at some point uh, the West actually cautioned Kenya that uh, you know you, you guys you need to, to vote uh, wisely because you know every decision that you make has will actually have likely to have a consequence a consequence so if you if you if, if you look at if you look at those statements that were made by the west is some kind of uh, you know they were lecturing africans they were lecturing kenyans on who to vote for now as things will happen actually uh Kenyatta won won the election and he became the president of the Republic of Kenya. So what did what did he do? I remember this country Kenya has deep you know colonial uh, uh, rather uh, heritage new colonial um, uh, heritage uh, engagement uh, with deep economic interest from the West. Now increasingly as China has shown interest in, 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 in African development, in Kenya's development, China has become a viable, a potential partner to, you know, sort of act as a, as a counter to the West. So what we're seeing here, even as it happened in August 2013, Kenyatta making a first uh, state visit to China in itself was really significant. And the message was very clear. Well, you don't want to you don't want to deal with us because we are we are we, we, we are suspects. So we've got another partner in the name of China. We can still do business. We can still build our infrastructure. And when the president went to China, he was warmly welcomed. You know, he was you know given fantastic treatment. And 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 to 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 that, uh, you know, was really really uh, useful. Um, Chinese were able to provide much needed infrastructure support and this is where this is what he he's referring to you know friends and you know trying to see at that particular time when they were facing having challenges uh, but the mere fact that China came on board and welcomed them you know this is a true friend all you know the, the, the old weather friend and, and therefore they have been able to uh, do um have able to heighten engagement for now almost 10, 10 years. Now, what we are seeing here is appreciation that, um, that uh, in, you know, on matters development, we don't, we don't need, uh, you know, to have, to have, you know, this vertical kind of, uh, you know, uh, engagement where somebody has to direct what to do. But we need a partner who is able to horizontally bring us together, seeing each other as, as friends, so that then at the end of the day, we can have a win-win uh, situation. This is what African uh, countries have actually argued as the main uh, driving force behind their liking of uh, China's presence on the continent. Kobus, I can hear people in Washington saying that Kenyatta is saying this because the Chinese are very effective at elite capture, at corruption. We know there was widespread corruption in the Standard Gauge Railway deal. So they discount some of this talk of win-win development from people like Kenyatta. What's your take on his comments? You know, Kenyatta's political career, or then at least his, his career as, as leader, um, coincided very neatly with this this window in Chinese engagement in Africa during which they were very bullish on on African on African financing 
Um, and they they were moving aggressively, to, you know, kind of in the context of the BRI to to fund a lot of a lot of infrastructure. And sure, I mean, a lot of that infrastructure, you know, ended up being tainted by the fact that that some of the deal making was corrupt, particularly the standard gauge railway. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there's now a whole bunch of infrastructure there that there didn't used to be, you know. So, so I mean, one could one yeah, obviously there's a lot of a lot of kind of like complaints around those that deal making, and and there's Kenya would definitely have been better off with better deals. But that doesn't take away from from the fact that that there is all of this. Or you know, Kenyatta is one of is, is ends up being one of the few African presidents who, at the end of his tenure, can literally say, "Look at look at this 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 that I that that I kind of facilitated during my tenure," you know, which is which is rare in 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 Africa. Um, of course, the debt is the other side of that story. And Oscar, I wanted to ask you actually about like Kenyan reactions to the debt. Um, you know, going in, everyone predicted that that Wang Yi's visit in, in Kenya is going to be all about the debt. I personally expected that there was going to be a great kind of outpouring of of kind of like anxiety and so on in in Kenya around around the high levels of debt. In you know, early on, our our frequent collaborator Cliff Mboye pointed out um, that there was actually that the the response on on Kenyan social media and in even in in official Kenyan press. Was relatively muted um, around around this issue, and I was wondering how, like, whether it picked up, and what what your impression was of the domestic reaction to the debt issue, particularly. As you know, on 9th August this year, uh, Kenya will be heading to an election, the third election uh, after the promulgation of the new constitution, and politician, uh, leading presidential candidate, at least now we we have uh, two, but other politicians as well have uh, used uh, the so-called credit lines obtained from China to package their campaign message. And what we're hearing is an attempt by each presidential candidate to frame the issue of uh, you know debt sustainability as a major campaigning uh, aspect. We are seeing um, uh, some talking about economic recovery and management, uh, uh, you know, around the question of renegotiating, uh, renegotiating debt uh, with Chinese government, you know, Exim Bank. And uh, w- w- when 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 they visit, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, it was actually primed that um, that, the, that the, the the foreign minister is is also likely to to highlight on issues to do uh, with the you know debt restructuring. Given that actually uh, COVID has really you know uh, you know not been so fair to you know to the economic growth at least going by the digits that we saw last year, and therefore. Um, as the country uh, begins to repay Chinese credit line, there has been that talk has actually been rife that there is need to restructure, uh, you know, the Chinese loan. Uh, the, the 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 fact that this did not come out, you know, uh, uh, during du- during the visit actually uh, left some of <laughs> some of the observers, you know, why their mouth wide open as as to the extent to which China's commitment to debt restructuring uh, is, is concerned. And uh, looking at, um, you know, some, some, some report that I have seen uh, elsewhere, for example, in, in, in Sri Lanka, I'm aware that actually uh, the talk surrounded around the, you know, revolve around the question of debt restructuring, uh, you know, as far as the Chinese credit lines are concerned in that country. So in Kenya, it was it was different. It was something else, and as I have said, uh, you know, it, that left some of us really, uh, you know, keen to know uh, what was, you know, the, the, the hallmark of the the, the, the visit in, um, in 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 this particular country. Well, let's put the debt issue in Kenya in some perspective. Uh, Kenya's parliamentary budget office released some new forecasts for the country's total debt. Now, again, Kenya's debt is a little bit different than other African countries' debt in that it is almost evenly split between 
domestic creditors and external creditors. So the Parliamentary Budget Office, the PBO, which is the most credible agency for releasing these debt information, they put a forecast that said by this year, which is this summer, uh, $78 billion will be the total amount that Kenya owes to all of its creditors. And by next year, that's going to increase to $87 billion. So the amount of debt has been really going up quite a bit under the Kenyatta administration. So this is one of his legacies as well. The amount that is currently owed to China stands at about $6.1 billion. So that puts it at around 8% of the total debt. So there's a lot of ways of framing Chinese debt. So when you look at bilaterally, the Kenyans borrow more from China than anywhere else. But because Kenya draws on a lot of different sources, Eurobond, IMF, World Bank, the Japanese, the French, domestic, all these different sources, the Chinese debt actually stands at just around 8%. So with that in mind, uh, the question of the debt trap came up in the press conference that, that Wang Yi had, and here's how he responded to it. As for the so-called narrative trap, the, the debt trap, that is simply not a fact. It is speculation being played up by some with ulterior motives. And this is a narrative trap created by those who don't want to see development in Africa. If there is any trap, it is about poverty and underdevelopment. China would like to work with other countries friendly toward Africa and African countries to eliminate poverty and get out of underdevelopment and to realize recovery in the post-COVID-19 era and to contribute to Africa's pursuit for independent and sustainable development. Oscar, the Chinese are completely wrong and dumbheaded when they continue to place the burden on the debt trap narrative solely on the U.S. and Europe, those who they say have ulterior motives, when in fact, as you know, in Kenya and across Africa, there are a lot of people who don't have ulterior motives but are very concerned that their assets are in jeopardy because of the extensive amounts of debts that their governments have gotten into and the fact that there is no transparency to these debts. In fact, Oscar, it's your attorney general right now who is in the high court fighting civil society stakeholders to keep the standard gauge railway contract secret. This is not being done by the Americans. It's not being done by the French. It's not being done by the British. It's being done by the Kenyans themselves. Give us your reaction to whether or not you think Wang Yi's case will persuade anybody in Kenya who suspects that there are, in fact, ulterior motives by the Kenyatta administration and the State House on debt issues, and will it change people's minds about the debt trap narrative? This one is coming a little bit late because uh, the whole notion about Chinese debt, uh, debt uh, uh, trap nar narrative, in a, in, a, in a sense, has been um, uh, widely appropriated uh, within, you know, the mindset of uh, many African, many Kenyans. And this is rooted in the very sense that, uh, you know, Cobas talked about, we, we, you also reinforce the whole notion about transparency and elite collusion, where um, we are not able to see and know the exact amount of this credit line. Even as we are talking today, although there are figures that have been shared in the media, but for sure we do not know if that is the exact amount of, for example, um, spending on standard gauge railway. So we have been left with the figures, but the, the contracts have never been open to the public scrutiny. And that is in contravention to Kenyan law, if I understand correctly, right? Kenyan law obligates the government to publicize those contracts. So at the end of the day, the people we should be blaming for this are as much the Chinese, of course, who insist on secrecy, but also the Kenyans themselves. Exactly, exactly. You, you, you see, uh, civil, society activist, uh, civil society activists actually have uh, taken advantage of uh, our, our current you know, um, uh, legal framework. We, we have a very robust law on access to, access to information, 
which actually provides that any any member of the public can can seek in, can seek court order to have these documents released so that they can be scrutinized that has not happened the president himself actually uh, in, in an interview with one of the leading uh, media station in the country promised promised you know that he will actually provide details of the um, of the funding nothing has happened up to this day so what what then that happened is the general public has been left to guess the content of the loan with the, so much speculation about how much the funding of SGR costed we have been left to believe that actually the project even costed double and and and, and, and therefore you know this speculation have you know have actually heightened uh, you know the, the the talk around debt narrative so much uh, so much that actually this has in a way been uh, taken to be like the gospel truth <laughs> On that point, um, how big a role do you think the debt and then larger connections with China is going to play in the upcoming election? Okay, it reminds me of the, the Zambian case. Opposition leaders may actually use that narrative, you know, to advance their case in a way sort of just to convince the public that, hey, uh, we are the solution to economic mis mismanagement in the country. That as a ploy to sort of get... Uh, votes here and there, but I, I, I highly doubt whether even if even if whoever whoever presidential candidate uh, pushes for that strong agenda against uh, Chinese debt trap narrative and wins, if he's likely to sort of say okay uh, to have a very strong opposition against uh, Chinese credit line in Kenya, because they are much and China actually has played a uh, you know a leading role as far as uh, borrowing is concerned. So what I'm what I'm seeing here is um, it's, it's it's not it's not going to be really uh, an, an an issue that uh, one can uh, for sure say that it's going to determine uh, you know sort of to sway uh, a significant chunk of uh, of voters perhaps those undecided uh, to you know go to, to go to a certain direction. So what we are seeing here is um, is it, it, just uh, what is is a campaign is a campaign narrative. But to the extent that uh, it's going to really have um, uh, you know a serious uh, a push towards certain uh, you know uh, you know uh, voters go, swinging in a certain direction, I I, I don't think so. Okay, well, we're going to follow up with you later in August, and we'll see what happens in the elections and what role China plays. Oscar, thank you so much for taking the time. You've given us an enormous amount to think about and to consider about this important trip. It was a fascinating discussion with you. Oscar Otere is a lecturer in the political science department at the University of Nairobi and now becoming a regular contributor to our podcast. So thank you so much, Oscar. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Eric, once again for having me uh, uh, into this discussion. Kobus, this tour that Wang Yi did was really important on a number of levels. And it was a little bit disappointing to me. And again, I, I don't know why I'm disappointed anymore about this kind of stuff, because I should be used to it after all the years you and I have been covering it. But the fact that more people in places like Washington, Brussels, Paris, London – are not paying attention to what's going on. They aren't listening to the speeches. They weren't, it, it barely got any coverage. I mean, the AP covered it a little bit here and there, but it didn't make any of the the major news. The BBC didn't do any special programs on it or any special reports on it, as far as I could hear. And, and I monitored this stuff pretty closely and I didn't see much at all. It was very much under the radar. And that's unfortunate in part because it's in the types of speeches that we showcased and in the comments and in the details of these meetings that you start to pick out the trends. And you see the focus, as you pointed out, on the Indian Ocean and not this completely just dumbheaded idea that the Chinese want to build a base in the Atlantic. They want to build up their capacity in the Indian Ocean because that is a strategic maritime route and a point of contestation with the Indians, and they're building up these overland trade routes through Myanmar and Pakistan and whatnot that all pass through the Indian Ocean, not the Atlantic, 
and because they want to avoid the Straits of Malacca issue, where that's a potential choke point in the event of a conflict with the United States. So you start piecing all of these things together and you get a much broader mosaic. But missing in the discourse is the detail that you get from these kinds of trips. And again, I, I just I read I read all of this stuff about the US China dispute, and then you hear about these these US China analysts talking about China and the world, and they're not reflecting anything like what President Kenyatta said. Yeah, it's 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 revealing. I think um, you know. I think, as you said, at the moment, there's 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 a kind of a mood in Washington, you know, where people are mostly interested in in what people on their side are saying, rather than trying to get a kind of a comprehensive map of what's actually happening. Um, and I think that might be you know kind of feeding into that. Um, I think there's also part of it is also just a lack of interest in Africa um, and a lack of interest in the global south. I think, despite you know, kind of obviously all of this. Yeah, there wasn't much coverage in Africa either on the on the trip. Yeah, 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 I think so. I think you know, it's it's it is a moment. You know, people are preoccupied with other things. You know, kind of, and I think I think they're kind of preoccupied with 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 COVID issues. They're preoccupied with economic issues. Um, and even in Africa, I think you, you know, kind of the, you know, it, it, this this might be the downside to to the to the Chinese kind of constant kind of engagement, because the visit of someone like Anthony Blinken just becomes bigger news because it's rarer, you know. Whereas Wang Yi has been in and out of Africa several times last year. It, there was a big FOCAC summit late last year, so in a way, I think you know, kind of it, it just it's just kind of normalized that that Wang Yi will be around. Which of course is, a, is a somewhat of a misreading, you know, considering the the size of China and the size of Africa. I think it also plays to the Chinese interest to have low key meetings. I think that when they're not in the the full glare of the Western media, they get to focus on the issues they want to focus on, not responding to 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 criticisms from the U.S. and from Europe and from others. So in some ways, I think this low key approach actually serves their interest. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Sri Lanka on debt. So the Chinese have been very recalcitrant in in Africa at canceling or rescheduling large amounts of the debt. There's been a lot of reschedulings that have been in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions, but nothing in the billions. And yet what we see unfolding in Sri Lanka is going to be a very interesting test. And in part because Sri Lanka holds a lot of political symbolism in the whole debt trap discussion because this is in fact where it all began with the port of Ambandota and the Indian scholar who who whose name I escapes me but uh, Brahmia Chalani I think is his name and he used the port of Ambandota as a case study for Chinese debt trap diplomacy one has to think that if the Sri Lankan economy implodes as Citigroup seems to think it might based on the current and burgeoning financial crisis and that debt plays a big part of that, that China could amplify some of the problems that they've been facing on this whole debt trap narrative. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if okay, now we're in, in if territory, but like, you know, kind of if there is a significant economic crisis in, in Sri Lanka, then the everyone in India and everyone in the US is going to try and blame China for it, you know. So so there's definitely there's definitely, you know, some stakes there. On the other hand, you know, kind of, it, it is also interesting how how so much so much of of what we're seeing in places like Sri Lanka and the Maldives and so on is is also a dynamic that that we're seeing in South in, in occasionally in Southeast Asia, where the the kind of the the competition between you know kind of local big powers, so between China and India particularly, tends to then also kind of play into domestic political cycles and you have this kind of succession of pro-India, pro-China, pro-India, pro-China kind of governments in some of these countries. Um, you know, so, so and, and on each case, you know, China isn't the only one offering investment and they're not the only one with big companies ready to roll out big infrastructure. India offers very similar offers to, to many of these countries. So it's then going to be very interesting to see how, how a, 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 a tiny country like the Maldives, for example, how decision making by local voters there can then have these kind of you know, kind of theater-wide kind of reverberations between between the kind of balance of power between India and China. Let's leave our conversation there today. I want to make sure we get out at around an hour. I hate podcasts that go over an hour just because I think it's indulgent. Uh, very quickly before we say goodbye, again, just a quick reminder to everybody that we're covering these issues every single day. If you're in the space of following China and the Global South or you're just interested in it, 
Uh, there is no better resource than the China Africa Project. We have a burgeoning team of our own now. Arabic and French are coming. Cobus is writing these fantastic columns. We have a China editor who's finding these amazing research articles and academic pieces that really give the insights that you don't pick up in the mainstream coverage of China. So this great insight, it's a resource that embassies and foreign ministries and corporations and, and senior level policymakers and scholars around the world uh, now read every single day. And we would love for you to join this community of readers. Go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we also have this Patreon community, which is super fun. We're doing, I think we're going to do breakfast this this this, this week, and then we'll do a happy hour later on in on Friday, uh, where we're meeting with different folks from around the world just to have these chats like what we're doing now. So if you want to kind of hang out with Kobus and I, that's great. Kobus, you're not going to join me. I'm not going to subject you to this for our late night U.S. meeting because that's like three in the morning for you. But I am doing that because the last time we had some folks join us uh, at five in the morning and I thought that was just so amazing. So I want to make it easier for our, our Patreon members in the United States to join us. So we'll have those meetings this week. If you want to join our community and support this program, which we, we, again, are so grateful, we need your support, we appreciate your support, you can go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. We have memberships that start at $5, $10, and $20 a month. So that'll do it for this edition of the podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. For more information about the China Africa Project, go to chinaafricaproject.com. Project.com.